in my last video, I talked through some diagrams I drew up when I was working out how to synchronize the CPU clock to the GPU clock in my simplest VGA combined with Ben Eater's 6502 project. That was all talking over pen and paper drawings. I thought it'd be worth following up with a more practical demonstration of that. But before we start, I wanted to do a quick straw poll on a potential future video. I recently looked into how dynamic RAM works and, and it got me interested in trying to make my own in a simple breadboard circuit with discrete MOSFETs. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking of having an experiment with that. I'll probably film it if I do. And uh, I'd love to hear if anyone's interested in that or if anyone has any tips as to what you think I should look into for that or any particular aspect of it you're interested in, then do let me know and I can try and include them. And if you're interested in that, obviously do subscribe and hit the bell if you want to be notified, because I think I probably will do a video on that soon. So what I've built up here is a simple 555A stable timer circuit, um, which is outputting a clock signal on this left-hand LED here. And this is feeding into a 4-bit counter exactly the same as I have in the GPU side of my Simplest VGA project. And the counter output is in the next four LEDs over here. So you can see every time the clock LED comes on, the 4-bit counter advances by 1. And when it gets all the way up to 15, of course it wraps around. So here's a circuit diagram in case you want to understand this better, so do pause the video and have a look at that if you're interested in how that works, or in case you want to copy this bit of the circuit yourself so that you can follow along with the rest of the video. So what we were trying to do uh, in the last video was find a signal out of this clock that we could use as, uh, as the CPU clock. And there were some constraints on that because we needed to also be able to time certain other things relative to that clock. And the main thing I showed you there, which I wanted to demonstrate practically, was this technique for phase shifting using a D flip flop. So to demonstrate that, let's uh, let's put a red LED in here, and I'm just going to wire that up to the uh, highest bit, I guess, of the of the counter for now. Um, the one that changes least often. So I'm going to use a red wire for that. Hopefully that will keep it clear. And give it a resistor to ground. Oops, didn't plug it in the right hole. Is that better? So that should now copy the top LED, the, 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 the rightmost LED. The, LED. the red LED should come on when that one does. And this is something that we could use as a CPU clock. It comes on and then it goes off. It's a nice even 50% square wave. And of course, the way the frequency division works, we could have picked any of these for that. If we pick one further down, it'll just change more often. So that's a fairly standard frequency divider thing going on there. What I wanted to show you here was how we can phase shift that. So I'm going to leave the red LED hooked up exactly like that, and I'm going to add a green LED. Just next to the red one. Give that its own resistor to ground. And what I'm going to do with this green LED is I'm going to wire it up to this D flip-flop. Now the D flip-flop over here is pre-wired in a neutral configuration. So we have power in the top left, we have ground in the bottom right, um, and the on the top half of the chip we have a reset line held high. I've left the data line unconnected, then the clock line is low, doesn't really matter which way which way that one is in this neutral configuration as long as it's constant, and the and the set line is held high as well here. And then the next two pins are the output and the inverted output. On the bottom row, the pins are in exactly the same order, so we have set held high, here we have the clock held high, and reset is held high. So what I'm going to do next is connect the green LED to the uninverted output of that D flip-flop, like so. 
and that, that that's come on the, the flip-flop happened to be in the active state there and I'm going to remove the clock link here and I'm going to connect the clock input to one of the one of, one of the faster bits on the uh, on, on the counter and that still won't do anything useful without also connecting the data input to the D flip flop so let's connect that data input to the same line that's driving the red LED and what you should find now is that the D flip flop will copy the red LED but it will be slightly delayed so what I've actually joined it to here is the second bit of the counter, the clock line, which is the middle LED of this group of five. So every time that middle LED comes on, the green LED copies what the red LED is currently doing. So now the red LED is on, and the, when this one came on, the green one copied it. Now the red LED is off, and when this one comes on, the green one will copy it as well. So the green one is delayed until the thing its clock line is connected to goes high. And if I move it one to the left, it will be delayed by less. So now the red LED is on, and the green one came on much sooner. And wait for the red LED to go off again. And the green one's off. So that's now that's now copying the red LED, but being delayed by much less. And if I move it to the to, to the right, it's now connected to the second from the right LEDs here, and it will copy the red one, uh, but but be about half a period out of phase. So the green one stays on until that one comes on, and now it's gone off. Now the red one comes on, and the green one will wait for that LED here to turn on, and now it's come on. So you can see that's quite a flexible way to phase shift a clock signal. Um, it only works if you connect it to a higher frequency clock and you can phase shift it by, I mean, if, if, if the higher frequency clock is, a, is twice the frequency, for example, it will phase shift it by half of the, well, a quarter of the wavelength, half of the on period. So that works pretty well. What I'm gonna do now is put that back to the one I had it on to begin with. And I want to show you uh, an additional technique now, um, which is the reset technique that I mentioned in the last video. So in addition to picking one of the data lines to copy and uh, a higher frequency clock line, what you can also do is connect the set or reset pins. I usually use the reset pin. You can connect these up to other clock lines. And what happens when you do that is the green LED will come on as normal, but it will turn off when that reset signal goes low. So for example, what I could do is connect the reset of the green LED to the same signal that's driving the red LED again. So let's give that a go. I'm gonna disconnect its reset pin from where it is now. And I'll use this little jumper. And I'm actually gonna connect it to the same, to, to the data pin because the data pin's already connected to the, to the red LED. So what you should see now is when the red LED comes on, the green one still comes on slightly later. So there's the red LED coming on. There's the green one copying it. And when the red LED now goes off, the green one will go off straight away. So the red LED is on for half the cycle and off for half of the cycle. The green one is now only on for a quarter of the cycle and it's actually, it, it, it's actually on for the second half of the red one being on. So let's um, try another thing here. I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is hook up a blue LED as well. Like so. Um, I'm going to connect the blue LED to this bottom half of this D flip-flop. And that's, oh, it needs a resistor. So 
so that's currently come on. And let's unplug the clock signal from being hardwired there. And what should we join this one to? Well, one thing that could be interesting would be to join the uh, clock for the blue LED to a higher frequency clock than, what, than the one that's driving the green LED. And I can join the blue LED's value to the output from the green LED's D flip-flop. So before I do this, you might want to try and guess what's going to happen. Bear in mind what we did earlier when we were connecting up the green LED to copy the red LED with a, with a phase delay. This is going to do exactly the same thing. The blue LED is going to copy the green LED and it's going to be phase delayed by what I've connected its clock to. So let's join that on there. So you see the red LED come on, the green one comes on, and the blue one copied the green one, very slightly delayed. Now the green one went off and the blue one went off again with the same delay after it. So that's a kind of a demonstration that you can actually layer these. So if you have any signal, you can use this method to delay it until the next rising edge of any clock signal you want. Um, it only really works if the clock signal is relatively high frequency compared to the signal you're delaying. But the clock signal and the data line don't need to be kind of outputs of the same counter like I originally did here. The blue one is delaying a totally different signal, which is the, the value of the green LED. And yeah, so it works for that sort of thing as well. And let's try one more example. I'm going to disconnect the blue and green uh, flip-flops for a moment. Maybe I'll leave the green one connected there uh, for now. Um, I'm actually going to I'm actually going to put the uh, the green LEDs reset line high high once again, so that it just copies the red LED but with a slight phase delay. So that should be doing that now. And what I'm going to do with the blue one is I'm actually going to uh, wire the blue one up fairly similarly to how I, did, how I did the green one before. Uh, the blue one's data line is actually going to come from um, the value of the red LED, which is the same as the green one's data line up there and the blue one's clock is going to be driven slightly slower than the green one's. So, so what I've tried to set up here is a situation where the green LED will come on, then the blue one will come on, but the blue one will then turn off before the green one turns off. So this is like one clock line going high for quite a long time, and then another one pulsing in the middle of that. And again, you can play with the timings. You can you can drive at either of these from from different places here to change the relative timings of those things coming on. Um, it's it's really quite flexible, and um, all this is done with just one pair of D flip flops connected to the timer chip. You can get quite a lot of different timings out. You can't do everything you might want to. These D flip flops only clock on rising edges of clock signals, so sometimes you might need an inverter to invert a clock signal. Um, in order to get a pulse at the right time that you want it. And if you remember in the video when I talked through those hand-drawn diagrams, uh, in a couple of cases I was indeed inverting like the, the main clock I think I had to invert at one point, um, and sometimes I inverted one of the lines coming out of the counter as well. And that was just so that I could get a rising edge at the, at the point I wanted it. Um, so that the D flip flop would clock on it. So yeah, I hope that's interesting. Um, I, as I said, I just wanted to do a quick practical follow-up to that rather theoretical video. 
um, showing the technique in action and showing some of the kinds of things you can do with it. Um, I do, as, I said, as, as I said in the other video, I do find it quite flexible and quite a powerful technique. Um, I've had problems in the past with simply anding and oring uh, outputs from these kinds of counters together because um, I think in some cases when multiple pins on the counter change at the same time they can kind of be hovering in a intermediate state and sometimes it can cause uh, combinatorial logic to give a sort of false positive kind of spike um, and if you if your if your combinatorial logic is being used to drive something that's edge triggered then that kind of little spike can really mess things up for you and that's bitten me in the past that's so that's why I tend to favor doing things this way now um, I always try to make my circuit synchronous where possible I try to have some form of master clock usually with multiple divisions of it and anything I want the system to do I tend to think of it in terms of which point during that clock I want it to do it and then use a circuit something like this to arrange for a signal to go high at the right time. Anyway, that's about that. I hope this has been interesting. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions about it. As I said before, it's a technique that I find very useful. I hope you do too. And I think it must be a standard technique because it's such a simple thing to do. Um, so if you know what it's called, let me know. Love to hear that. And do let me know if you find it useful in your own circuits. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.